Hi, and welcome to NeuroCare Academy. I'm Dr. Trevor Brown, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Alexander Sack from the Netherlands. How, how are you, Alex? Hello, Trevor. Thank you. I'm fine. How about you? Yeah, doing very well. Thank you. And uh, look, it's, it's a real honor to speak with you. You've done some great research and, um, and also with the view of, um, you know, translating that into clinical practice as well. So uh, look, uh, it's going to be a, a real lot of fun to, to chat away with you about your, your different research, etc. So um, look, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, Professor Dr. Alexander Sack is Professor of Brain Stimulation and Applied Cognitive Neuroscien Neuroscience at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Yes. And um, yeah, look, that's um, quite a title there and I'm sure it's not your only one. So I'd, I'd really love to know about how you got into this. Uh, we're gonna be talking about your past, um, your education and uh, the research that you've done. We're also gonna be talking a little bit about uh, your current research and, and the future. So um, look, um, really great to get your experience and insight into this field of neuromodulation. So. Um, look, Alex, we might begin um, with um, you telling us a little bit about your, 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 your past, your PhD and, your, your, and that sort of stuff. Um, would you like to um, share some slides and, and talk us through that? Uh, so as you said, my name is Alexander Zak. I'm currently a professor of brain stimulation and applied cognitive neuroscience at Maastricht University. I'm also the director of an institute, of, uh, a center of um, uh, integrative neuroscience, a very interdisciplinary endeavor, and I come to this also later, because that actually is something that shaped me throughout my entire career since a student, the, um, the importance of working interdisciplinary, so uh, with colleagues with various backgrounds. And I'm also the scientific director of the TMS Depression Clinic at the Academic Hospital in Maastricht, which we opened a few years ago, and I negotiated also the, um, the reimbursement scheme with health insurances, which was an interesting experience. Uh, and about myself, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm now in the Netherlands, in Maastricht, in the Netherlands, a small, very lovely town, uh, 100,000 uh, people living here. And I came here in 2003, so it's almost, um, almost 20 years. I'm originally uh, a German. I was born in Germany, in uh, Frankfurt am Main, in Germany, uh, which is a much bigger city. Around 800,000 people live in, in Frankfurt am Main. And it's mainly known in Germany and maybe beyond of being the, the center also of the European Central Bank. So it is one of the few cities uh, that really have, um, you know, these huge bank glass buildings, these uh, 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 sky, uh, 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 these, these high towers uh, made, of, made, of, made of glass of all the big European banks. That's why uh, we in Germany refer to it also as uh, Manhattan. You know, mine the river where Frankfurt is and referring to Manhattan, that's German humor, I guess. Uh, so it's a nice, it's a nice city uh, to live in also because besides all this banking and financial uh, center, it is also a very lively and multicultural uh, diverse city with, with a lot of foreigners uh, from, from, from many countries, food from all over the world. And this is where I grew up in, in, this, in this melting pot, uh, which, I, which, which I loved. Um, uh, and I also did the start of my education in Frankfurt. I did my, uh, my studies there. I studied psychology originally. That's how I started. Uh, um, a big interest in cognitive psychology. So I'm, I'm a psychologist by training. But towards the end, and that was in the, in the, um, in the mid-1990s, mid uh, there was this big movement starting in psychology and beyond focusing more on the biological substrates of human behavior. So biopsychology, biological psychology. So I've shifted more and more into this. I also took courses in, um, in, uh, in, in neurophysiology and uh, learned about the brain and uh, did, uh, did my master then also in a lab, in a, in a hospital setting already, looking at, at brain processes. Uh, and most importantly, then triggered by this interest, um, I did my uh, PhD in a, a very unique setting, I think, for the time. Uh, uh, that was uh, end, end 1990s, 2000. Uh, I started a PhD in a laboratory, which was uh, located in the psychiatry in Frankfurt, in a research lab at the end 
of a long corridor hidden in a corner of the hospital far away from the patients at this point, a laboratory which was called Lab for Neuroimaging and Neurophysiology. In this lab were a, a mixture of, of young scientists and researchers, researchers from various backgrounds. There, was, there were um, residents, uh, uh, people go, doing a resident in psychiatry, uh, people with a background in clinical neurophysiology, neurologists, engineers, bioengineers, cognitive psychologists like myself. And we all sat together and had to learn to speak to each other, had to learn to understand each other's language, which was interesting. And um, the, uh, the apple cider that's uh, where Frankfurt is famous for helped a lot in the evening to, um, to make this bridge uh, easier. And uh, this was also the, the context in which I focused on my PhD topic very early in, this, uh, in, in my career, which was already the wish to, um, to move the technology further. The technology of TMS, uh, which I worked with uh, in my PhD, and the idea that it would be very, very important to not only do TMS and see what happens to human behavior or to clinical symptoms, but to really understand what's happening in the brain. And to this end, we thought it would be important to technically develop into, into ways to combine TMS with other techniques, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging or EEG. So in essence, my PhD topic was on the combination of TMS with fMRI in the context of human behavior. So we have participants in the fMRI scanner. We scan their brain activity during certain cognitive tasks, memory, attention tasks. We see the network activity, and then we combine this with TMS to stimulate certain areas of the brain focally with a figure of eight coin, but also use the fMRI then to, to really assess and validate and understand what happens in the brain as a consequence of TMS and how these changes in the brain translate to changes in behavior. And therefore I did my PhD actually in natural science. Um, and I received this in 2003 at Frankfurt uh, University. And then I did a couple of, of research fellowships and postdocs uh, also in other countries, including for example, the US. I went to the, like probably every, TMS researcher nowadays, had, I had my time in Boston with Alvaro Pascual Leone, uh, which was a wonderful uh, learning experience for me there at the, at the Harvard Medical School. And in the end, uh, as I said, uh, since, uh, since almost 20 years now, I'm, uh, I'm in Maastricht, where I started my own research lab. I, got, I was fortunate enough to re uh, receive a lot of funding. And with the funding, I could build a, a big group. We are now probably 15 to 20 researchers in, in my group, all interested in, in working with brain stimulation and cognition. That's the name of our lab, brain stimulation and cognition. And uh, as you said, I'm now a full professor of brain stimulation and applied cognitive neuroscience. I'm extremely happy in Maastricht uh, and the Netherlands. It's a wonderful place to be. Oh, fantastic. What a background. And thanks for, for sharing that. Um, and really, it's, it's great to see that you have such a, a varied um, I, I guess, experience in, in several different fields. And it's not easy to have the knowledge in psychology and neuroscience, but also have the um, adeptness in, um, in technology as well. And so your ability to use fMRI, TMS, and, and other neuromodulation techniques and, and to combine all these gives a very unique perspective on everything. So, so that's, that's wonderful. And, and so would you like to share a little bit of... Um, the research that you've um, you, you've done previously. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Trevor. Um, before I start with uh, with talking a little bit about my um, my previous research, uh, let me start with um, mentioning my uh, conflict of interests. Uh, being being a scientific advisor for um, for two companies, Plato Science and Alphasis. I have also my own uh, uh, own company, CEO Neuroware. I, um, I um, occasionally receive equipment support from two TMS manufacturing companies, MacVenture and, and Maxton. And I'm also the director of, um, of the International Clinical TMS Certification course that we, that we run a couple of times a year to, to train colleagues, psychiatrists, how to use TMS in clinical practice. 
But I was thinking what to present uh, here uh, from, let's say, our previous research of the last you know, 20, 25 years. Uh, and as you indicated, uh, a large part of my research is basic research. So I use TMS in healthy volunteers. And this has two reasons. I want to understand how the brain works because it helps us also to treat the brain if there's a brain disorder or a mental disorder. And I want to learn how TMS works because that helps us to further improve TMS to better help our patients. So I've done a lot of, uh, say, scientific, technical, um, psychological work. And I picked three examples uh, of studies we did in the last years that I think were instrumental for our current efforts to translate this into better treatment, into better depression treatment, into better OCD treatment for, for patients being uh, using TMS as a therapy. Because I realized that the main part of the audience watching this video is, is mainly interested in the clinical potential of TMS. But the first study is long ago from 2005. It's a work I did together with Pasquale Leone in Boston at Harvard Medical School. Uh, it was published a long time ago in Science. Uh, and I think it's an important study because it revealed that our brain is very plastic. It's very, it's very dynamic uh, and flexible. And that if we do TMS to the brain, we need to realize that we cannot just simply expect the brain to passively accept the brain stimulation that we apply. A brain is a, is a living dynamic organ. And when I start to, to, to apply TMS pulses to any region of this brain, there will be consequences also in other regions of the brain as a, as a reaction to this brain stimulation. And this is something that we showed in this, in this uh, science paper in 2005 already in the context of a particular cognitive task, the details are not so relevant here. So we had healthy volunteers in the scanner doing a cognitive task and not surprisingly, and that's almost true for almost everything we do, the brain works in networks. So it's not one area doing memory, one area doing attention, one area doing emotion regulation. That is not how it works. These are always large, widely distributed networks that are active when we perform any sort of behavior, cognition, emotion. So we identified this network, and then we realized that if we use TMS to target one of these regions, in the left hemisphere, on the right hemisphere, one of these various regions within this network that underlies this uh, cognitive ability that we're interested in, we realized that actually there is a reaction of the other areas of the brain trying to counteract sometimes the stimulation that we do. So this, this network is able to plastically reorganize as a consequence of TMS. In other words, if you give TMS to, to one region, it very well could be that the behavioral consequences that you see is not only the behavioral consequence of your local manipulation of TMS, but it's the net result of how the rest of the brain copes with this TMS-induced insult or TMS-induced stimulation. And that shows that uh, it's too simple to think that we, just, uh, we, just, we have a disease and there's an area that is too little or uh, 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 not enough active on, uh, or, or too active that we position the coil there and we try to increase or decrease its activation level. And we will do this and then we measure how the clinical symptoms improve. And we conclude from this that we succeeded or not succeeded in up or down regulating the activity. It is always um, possible of the rest of the brain to immediately during the stimulation, reorganize and reconfigure the network to potentially uh, compensate for the stimulation or even boost the stimulation. Uh, so there's this dynamic interplay between the areas in the network as one example of brain plasticity. And this is something that I will come back later to how we can actually utilize this to, uh, to develop better, more effective clinical protocols for TMS. 
The second study that I would like to highlight goes one step further. So I now told you already that the brain works in networks where areas dynamically form different networks and can reconfigure, you know, the same area could be part of network A or network B, and it is a flexible re reconfiguration of, of networks. And the TMS is just one part of this. So the big problem, uh, the big question is, what actually happens in these networks if we apply TMS to, for example, the prefrontal cortex as we do in depression treatment? Do we only stimulate the prefrontal cortex? And how does that translate into improvement of depression? What, where's the explanation? Does it make sense? Is depression located in the prefrontal cortex? The answer to all of this question is no. And, and how we can actually study this systematically is if we manage to do the TMS stimulation actually inside an fMRI scanner. So I literally mean to simultaneously do functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is this big machine where you lie in and you scan your uh, brain activity throughout the entire brain, and TMS being a technique that can locally stimulate an area of the brain. So we've done this, and <laughs> we, we applied the TMS inside the MR scanner. And the take home message here is that like I already indicated, it's very clear, whenever you stimulate one area of your patient's brain, this will always result not only in a local change of activity, like you, you intended to increase or decrease activity in the prefrontal cortex when you treat depression, that is the case, that is good, but it would always, under all circumstances, trigger activity changes in a network. In this example, this is real data, so we stimulate, for example, here, the right parietal area, so it's in the back of the, of the brain in the right hemisphere. This is the region we wanted to stimulate, and we did, but you can see that by putting energy via TMS into this one area, a whole network actually is modulated. It's always a network response of TMS. We speak of local effects of TMS and remote effects. These are remote effects. So it's a network. And we have also shown that if you, for example, by stimulating this area here in the parietal cortex, if this leads to a cognitive change or behavioral change in your subjects or patients, this is not necessarily the result of the, the causal result of a activity change at the place where you stimulate, but it might as well be the functional result of these remote network effects. So by stimulating here, you're changing also activity within this network because the spread of activity within this network, you're also changing activity here, and it might be this change that causes the behavioral changes that you see in your subjects or patients. It's very important to realize that we always talk about TMS network effects, which complicates the matter, but it's actually great news for clinical applications of TMS, because that's what we need. We need network effects. And now comes the second take home message from the second publication. These network effects were state dependent. That means if I do the exact same thing, I stimulate the, the same area with the same TMS coil, the same TMS protocol and intensity in the same person, everything is identical. The only difference is the state of the brain of this per person, for example, being resting or being actively engaged in a cognitive task or watching an exciting movie. These are different states of the brain. This brain state interacted with this network effect of TMS. That means the kind of network effect you get, the strength and even the type of network is dependent directly on the state of the brain. And we've shown this here with real data in healthy volunteers, but it has huge implications for the clinical applications of TMS because that trivially means you cannot assume that your TMS depression treatment will have in the brain the exact same effects if you don't control for the brain state. 
sometimes your patient might be tired. Sometimes your patient might be doing something actively during the TMS. And these different states of the brain, these cognitive states, will shape the network response of your treatment. At the moment, this is largely ignored. So we don't control, we don't standardize the cognitive state of our patient during depression. We just think that no matter in what condition, in what, in what, what emotional cognitive state the patient is there, just sit down in the chair, here's the TMS FDA depression protocol, and it will always do the same trick. Very unlikely to be the case because we know that TMS interacts with the state of the brain at which you, at, uh, at which you apply it. And that's why I think this is an important study from the fundamental work, combining TMS with FMI simultaneously. And Alex, if, yes. if we, within one subject, um, these states can change the effect of TMS, D what about between subjects? Can you say that the, if the desired effect is, for example, in a resting state, is the desired effect in a resting state across samples or across subjects, or is this still an, another variable? It's another variable. So you have the intra-subject variability because of changing states, but you also have huge variability between subjects, which, which, uh, which are caused by, by different, uh, different uh, um, factors, which I will also will uh, go to, uh, come to in, in a second. So it, it could be that this one size fits all approach that we use the same target and the same protocol for each and every depressed patient. It's very likely that this is also not an optimal way to do it because there are individual differences, which is the optimal target and what, what is the optimal protocol. And we could potentially personalize it. And I think, I, I strongly believe that by personalizing the depression treatment or other clinical treatments of TMS, we could actually very much still increase the already quite good remission and response rates of TMS. And that's independent of what I say here, that within your patient over the 30 sessions or whatever you do, it, you will have some days with a better uh, treatment and others with a worse because you don't control for the state of your patient during the TMS. It's, it's a neglected uh, area which you could easily solve and I come to this also in the future perspective. The last take home message is um, building up on this and it's a recent paper of us. So I, I already told you my, my two take home message. The brain works in networks. These networks are dynamic. They can actually during the TMS already change their configuration and organization to, to actively work with what's happening to the TMS as the TMS is and you know, the brain is, is not just accepting the TMS but it's working with it. It's, 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 you're stimulating an active, very, very flexible system and it will not just sit there and, and be passively stimulated. That was the first study. The second one showing you, <clears throat> no matter what you do, you have a spread of activation from your area where you stimulate along a network. It's a network response. And this network response is cognitive state dependent. Now, the last piece of the puzzle is that these networks, that I showed you with fMRI and fMRI is great because it has this spatial resolution that shows us in millimeter detail which area is active, subcortical structures. So it's wonderful, the coverage and the spatial resolution. But what I haven't told you yet is that how do these areas communicate with each other to form these networks? So what is their coding principles to communicate area A to B, let's be connected, Let's stop our connection because I would rather like to work with area C. What, how does it work? And we know how that works. It, works. it works in a temporal domain. It works via rhythmic brain activity. So it's an oversimplification to think that uh, the brain works with, um, uh, with an area being active or not active, on or off. That's not how the brain works. Instead, it works in rhythmic brain activity. So neurons fire in a certain temporal rhythm, like a musical instrument, like a drum. And they sometimes can synchronize and align with a rhythm in another area, and then they are connected. Their phases are connected, for example. If you look at this, these are neurons that fire, and this is time. And you see then 
this neural uh, ensemble is firing now and then silence and then firing again and then silence, firing again and then silence. And if you plot this like a wave, you actually can see this, this rhythm and you can actually measure it also how often these waves occur in one second. And if I count these waves, I come to 10 waves in a second, which we call 10 Hertz. It's a 10 Hertz rhythm, also known as the alpha rhythm. It's an important rhythm of the brain that has a, fun it has a function. And there are other rhythms out there, beta, theta, gamma, and they're all relevant, especially for network communication, what I just talked about. And we ignore this completely in TMS so far. And fMRI is incapable of measuring these rhythms because they're just too fast. fMRI is a great method to have a great picture of the brain, to see the networks, the spatial layout. It's, it's not possible to measure these rhythmic changes because they are so, 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 so fast and, and, and fMRI cannot, cannot capture them. But there's a very old method that can capture these temporal changes. And this is EG, electroencephalography. And uh, what we thought then is, well, technically again, it would be so great if you had a setup where we can do the TMS stimulation of one area inside the fMRI scanner to see the brain response, the network response of the brain, like I showed you before. We've done that already. I showed you the data. And we relate this directly to human behavior, cognition, emotion regulation. But now, in the simultaneous TMS and fMRI setup, we now even add another technology, which is EEG, to measure these, these rhythms of brain activity, these temporal, fast temporal changes of activity to understand the rhythm with which these network, networks communicate, these, these network nodes communicate. Because if you can do this, if you have a technical setup that can combine all these technologies into one setup, you could, for example, think, well, the cognitive state, and I showed you TMS state dependent, I told about patients that might be at rest or engaged in a cognitive task or watching an exciting movie, that all changes the cognitive state. But what does cognitive state mean? Cognitive state means that the spontaneous rhythm of your, of your brain is changing. For example, you know, Trevor, you're listening to me already for a couple of minutes. And while you're just passively sitting there and listening to me, I could easily with EEG measure, for example, your spontaneous ongoing alpha rhythm. It's always there, no matter what you do, it's just in the background, your brain is having a measurable alpha rhythm. And this alpha rhythm will change depending on your cognitive state. So if you get tired, if you get bored because you think it's not super interesting what Alex is talking about at the moment, I could see this if I had an EG on you and I could be upset about you because your alpha, the, the amplitude, the power of your alpha rhythm would increase, which wouldn't be an indication of not being cognitive engaged anymore, being bored, getting tired. So it's a direct translation of your state into the, this rhythm, this oscillatory rhythm. And the alpha rhythm has also been shown to be vital for whether or not to pass on the information of one area to the next area. It's, an, it's, an, it's a gate, let's say. So if the alpha rhythm is strong, the gate is closed. So the information is not, is not uh, passed on through the brain. And if the, if the alpha uh, rhythm is weak, then the gate is open and the information will spread. This we all know from, from animal research, from neurophysiological research. And now comes the great idea. What if we would measure the spontaneous change in Trevor's brain in the strength of this alpha rhythm? So we have it with EEG. We don't manipulate it. We just measure it. And it changes from moment to moment. Every second, there's another you know, measurement of how strong is your alpha rhythm in your brain. And then I happen to give my TMS pulse at a moment where your alpha rhythm is very strong. Then you could speculate that maybe then, because the gate is, is down, the TMS will have a very weak and only very local effect. It's actually not spreading along the network. It stays very focal. And in contrast, just a few seconds later, I give a TMS pulse 
to the same person, the same area, same TMS pulse. I just now give it at a moment, coincidentally, at a moment where the spontaneous alpha rhythm is weak. Then maybe I get a much stronger TMS response that actually spreads through the network, the depression network, let's say, as, as, I, as I desire. That would be the hypothesis. And the only way to test this is to really have a technical setup where you bring all of these things together into one uh, experiment. And this is what we did in Maastricht. We developed this over a couple of years where we can do EEG inside an MRI scanner, including TMS, while people perform different tasks. And it's a complicated setup. I don't go into the details, but I show you results that we published recently in, in Nature Communications. And this is very exciting work. And it's very, uh, it's work that has many implications for clinical TMS, I believe. And this is what I show you now. So we applied TMS to an area here, it's the premotor cortex, so cortical area because we all heard or read in books that TMS is great, but it has one big limitation. It cannot stimulate deeper lying structures. You can only stimulate the cortex, the superficial layer of the brain. It's because it cannot reach deep in the brain. If you wanna do deep, deeper brain stimulation, you need to do invasive deep brain stimulation, for example. That's just because of the limitation of TMS, a physical limitation. That's what we hear, that's what we learn. And this is partly true. But I show you something now. If I stimulate the premotor cortex with TMS and I measure with fMRI what happens in this area, I see from the fMRI machine that yes, this area shows an increase in activity induced by my TMS pulses. And this is shown here. But you see three colors, red, green, and blue. And these three colors are just the same response of this area, depending on the simultaneously measured strength of the alpha rhythm, like I told you before. So the red curve shows the activity change in this area induced by TMS when the alpha rhythm was weak. And as we hypothesized, you see then the actual activity induced by TMS is the strongest. So if I apply my TMS pulse here at a moment when the, the mu or the alpha power is low, strong response. If it's medium, medium response. And if the alpha power is high, and I told you alpha means the gate is down, don't respond to external or internal stimulation. That means this brain area is actually not, not reacting much to the TMS pulse. Although the TMS pulse in all three cases was same intensity, same area, same person. This is already super interesting and relevant and shows the state dependent that I showed, to, talked about. But now comes the real cool part. And this is that if I stimulate the cortex with TMS, and it's true, I can only stimulate the cortex directly. That is the limitation of TMS. But because of this communication and the spread of activity within networks, I can reach subcortical structures with TMS, even the thalamus. This is activity in the thalamus induced by TMS. It's not out of reach, it's just directly out of reach, but indirectly I can get there. And now comes the cool thing. The likelihood or the fact whether or not my TMS pulse to the cortex, to the superficial part of the brain will get propagated to the thalamus, yes or no, is directly dependent on whether I stimulate at a high or low strength of the cortical alpha rhythm. In other words, I have a window here to reach the thalamus, but I have to stimulate at the right oscillatory moment. I have to, stim I have to stim apply my TMS, I synchronize it with the ongoing brain rhythm in the cortex. And if I stimulate it always at the moment where in this case, the alpha rhythm is low, then my pulse will get sent directly to thalamus. If my TMS pulse is applied at a moment when the alpha rhythm is strong, the gate is down, this pulse will not reach thalamus. So not only can I reach networks, including subcortical structures with TMS, but I even have now 
I have the door and I now even have the key to get there. If I use the information of the oscillatory brain state as a very nice and subtle physiological index of brain state, almost independent from the cognitive brain state I told you about where, it's, where somebody is involved in a in task or, or resting, this is even during rest, spontaneous changes, very subtle changes in the strength of brain rhythms. And I think this has huge potential for personalizing, fine tuning TMS protocols that are synced with a personal brain rhythm of your patient to have a more robust and reliable network effect in depression, uh, much more than it is now the case, which could explain also the inter individual differences or the, um, the not perfect response and remission rates of some patients that you have this, I come to this later, but you have this fact that for some reason, one patient responds very well and another patient is, seems to not benefit from, from TMS. Here again, showing this data on the whole brain, we also had other frequencies. We looked at not only the, let's say the alpha 10 Hertz rhythm, but also the beta rhythm, which, which did a completely different thing. So if you synchronize it to the beta rhythm, you actually have the opposite. So if it's strong, then it helps the spreading of the TMS. And if it's weak, it's, 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 uh, it's preventing the spread. So it's a frequency specific. The so frequency band matters. And we know this makes sense in neuroscience and brain science because we know so much and still so little about which frequency bands are used for communicating within which networks, large distance networks, local networks, depending on the cognitive function and so on. And this is actually a tool that can help us to, to unravel this interplay between networks, network configuration, and temporal dynamics in the brain, rhythms of the brain. So independent from the clinical potential, this is a great tool to do fundamental research in the functional relevance and role of these, of these brain rhythms for, for cognition and, and human behavior. Yeah, look, that's, that's amazing, Alex, and it's great um, uh, potential for the future for personalizing and, and optimizing TMS, of course, as well. And so the different frequencies that we can stimulate with, with TMS, we can then um, match them to, to different frequencies in the brain, of course. And I'm sure you're going to talk about that a little bit afterwards and the potential that you have, you, you have for, the, for using this. One question that came up for me is, when you were recording the EEG, then you had a full cap. Um, I think it was a 19 electrode cap, was it perhaps or, or more? Um, is there a potential? Is there potential, Alex, for using one or two electrodes on specific sites to make it more clinically feasible um, in in a practice, for example? Absolutely. I mean, this is a, this is a basic research setting, right? So we go full force with everything, and we don't have to. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, usability, or feasibility, um, costs. So we, we, we just want to measure as much as possible. But for example, um, measuring the, uh, the uh, individual alpha, uh, as to stay with this example, the, uh, the strength of the alpha rhythm, you don't, need, you, need, you don't need so many electrodes to measure it. It could be really one electrode if it's placed correctly. And, uh, and I'm sure, and, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I would be surprised if... if um, commercial, um, they're not already working on commercial solutions for this, but you can, you know, people work on closed loop systems, right? And then these closed loop systems should be, should be um, user friendly and, and feasible. Um, and uh, with reduced electrodes, you can, you can do the trick. Uh, uh, no question about it. Great. Well, well look, as, as a midway point to, to just um, lighten the mood a little bit and reduce my alpha and, and everybody's Alpha, yeah. I have, a, I have a, a very important question for you, Alex. I have a yeah. question regarding um, if you were to hold a dinner party uh, at your house in, in Maastricht, um, who would you invite? Who, who are the people that you would love to spend some time with at a dinner party? Um, just to have a conversation. It doesn't have to be funny. It could be interesting. But what do you think? Oh, that's... Uh, that's, that's um... That's, a, that's an interesting and mean question to ask in such an interview. <laughs> uh, first of all, I love dinner parties because I love to eat and, and have a good glass, glass of wine. I'm not the greatest cook, so I would be very nervous um, to host them. Maybe I invite them also to cook along with me, but whom would I invite? Um, very, very difficult. I think when I had, as a, as, a, you know, as a young man, you have sometimes this question, who do you, whom do you want to meet or so? 
and and then it was always possible to it could be could be uh, celebrities could be normal people could be even you know people that are not not among us anymore and i always mentioned that um that uh, uh if possible i would like to um, to talk to jesus uh, the historical figure so he's always on my on my wish list because there are so many questions i have and um uh, I wonder about some decisions uh, he made, so uh, that would be a great uh, conversation. Uh, I think very recently, I don't know why, sometimes I have these obsessions that, that I find people interesting, and then I watch hours of hours of YouTube videos on these people, the interviews, and I find this, in, find this inspiring. And I don't know how that comes, but I'm, I'm almost, almost obsessed about it, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, is this, is this great? Is this inspiring? Or is this, is this just, is this just another fake uh, uh, ego person that you know, and and I have this recently with Elon Musk. Right. So I would invite Elon Musk because I'm really torn whether he's a genius or uh, or um, just crazy, and 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 with him, with him, you know, with all of his activity, even with a, with a Neuralink, so he's going a bit into our field and brain stimulation, and it's working in neural implants, and he's 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 giving lectures about. Um, you know the, the the bottleneck of current solutions and deep brain stimulation and the interfacing and so uh, so he does this you know with a, with a, with a bit our field and then what he says makes makes partly sense but he, he you know he, he all of a sudden is not an expert he hasn't studied for 25 years like i did but then he gives a big presentation and telling us all these things and then in the next talk he talks about rocket science which seems also a difficult science uh, to get into or electric cars and he seems to have all this technical knowledge about this. So I, I want to know, is this fake? Can I, in a, in a long dinner party, you know, instead of um, having a few questions on a YouTube video, find out whether this is all like abstract knowledge, you know, like reading a few abstracts and, and dropping a few terms and you, you, you appear to be knowledgeable. Does he really understand artificial intelligence, uh, how the brain works? And uh, yeah, that would be interesting, Elon you know, Musk. And who else? Um, Probably Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, because she's a, she, she will be not Chancellor anymore in September. Uh, um, besides Helmut Kohl, which was also in my youth, uh, Helmut Kohl was the eternal Chancellor. And I, uh, I, I thought um, there um, will always only be one Chancellor. That's a bit, bit of German story. Once they have a Chancellor, they stick with it for 12, 14 years. Kohl was one of them. So it was for me quite relieving to see that there can be democratic changes. And then Merkel actually was even longer than Kohl, I think. But she's very different from other politicians. Uh, she doesn't have this ego. She, she seems very relaxed. She doesn't seem to have, uh, you know, this this um, this need to show who's the stronger or so. And 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 I would like to talk to her about her experience in this still male-dominated world of politics. How she keeps her cool all the time. Uh, so that these would be the three people. I hope they also interact with each other. Well, that was my my next question. That would be very interesting yeah. interaction between all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you will well, talk some more. Yeah. Great, great answer. Not. Great answer, yeah. and um, it gives us some discussion points next time we meet. Um, but, <laughs> look, uh, so, so let's keep going. What, what, what about your, your research, Alex, um, at the moment and into the future? Obviously, you've done all this fantastic stuff with, with entrainment of the brain and uh, different frequencies of TMS and, and measuring that in a closed loop type system. So can you tell us anything about that? All right. Um, so I have also prepared a few slides about what, we are, what we're aiming to do now at the moment. And uh, which is then by definition also the future of the next few years, because I really can't look too much ahead. Things change so dynamically and, 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 and quickly in this field. But I, I noticed for myself, uh, because you know, I do this fundamental research, but as I said, I also now, um, I'm scientific director of the Dep depression TMS clinic at our academic hospital. Uh, so we treat patients with TMS and we do uh, different protocols, the FDA approved protocol. We also do um, theta burst stimulation. And of course it's an academic hospital. So it's, it's at the moment in the Netherlands actually um, an established and recognized treatment for depression. It is reimbursed by health insurances, which is great news by public health insurances. You don't, you don't need any special or private insurance to get it covered because the evidence was so convincing to the um, policymakers uh, in the uh, mental health uh, sector uh, in the Netherlands that me also being involved in negotiating with these people was very, I was very pleased to see how open they were and 
how it's now really included uh, in the reimbursement schemes of, of everybody's health insurance. But at the same time, because we're an academic hospital, we also do um, try to see how we can further improve it. Because I think even though it's an approved and even health insured covered therapy, we're still far away from having found the optimal way to use it to treat depression, not, to, not even to talk about applications and other disorders, which, which should follow a similar path uh, as depression did. And if I see my patients and I have all these great success stories, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have, you know, patients that were depressed for 10, 15 years and TMS, and then they didn't respond to medication or psychotherapy, and then they followed the four, five, six week TMS depression treatment, and they are in full remission for the first time. And, and, and they're so happy and so thankful. And the families, it's, it's, it's always impressive again and again to see this. And still, there are 40, 50% of the patients in our clinic and in the literature that come to our TMS um, center. And I, I cannot identify them as non-responders before the treatment. So I go with them through the whole six weeks, but in the end, we have to conclude that for some reason, for them, TMS didn't work, didn't make a big difference. So the biggest problem I have scientifically also as a scientist is why? Why is patient A benefiting from TMS so largely into full remission after chronic depression, we see that, and patient B, not at all, nothing, no benefit at all. Why is that? And of course, this question can be addressed in, in various ways, people working on, for example, at least finding some sort of treatment, response predictors, biomarkers, you know, looking for something that you can see in a patient before you go through the TMS treatment to indicate the likelihood of this patient to yes or no benefit from TMS. And I know many colleagues, including us a bit, are doing research in this line. Very difficult to present anything conclusive here, to be honest. Um, the other way to address this, which I will be talking about, is maybe the one size fits all approach is the reason why patient A is benefiting and patient B not. Because at the moment, we just have one very simple procedure FDA approved procedure, how to position the coil, where to position it, what protocol to run. And because depression is such a heterogeneous disorder, maybe it's just not that patient B wouldn't benefit from TMS, but it doesn't benefit from TMS the way we apply it in patient B. And the second problem is relapse. So uh, this is also something that's unsolved uh, and, and not not satisfying at the moment is that although we have this great tool of TMS to get people into remission, what do you do then? Uh, we do it as many others of you, I'm sure also do it that, well, you're in remission, you so you have to, you don't have to come anymore for TMS treatment, uh, go home, have fun. And if you do this, if you discontinue a successful treatment, we know there's literature about this, that the likelihood of relapse is extremely high. 80, 90% within a, a couple of years. Some patients come back after three months, others come back after a year, after cancer, come back after three years. There are a few that, that don't come back because hopefully they were really stable or they uh, seek um, help elsewhere, but there is this high percentage of relapse. So I think it's very clear that we need some sort of maintenance treatment something that keeps them stable uh, uh, after successful TMS treatment. So these are the two problems I'll, we work, work on at the moment. And I don't have many slides on this to not bore you with too many details, but one is actually directly utilizing our fundamental work I have presented uh, a few minutes ago. And now we translate this to the depression network. So I told you lengthily that TMS always has a network effect. And the depression protocol of TMS also has a network effect. So if you stimulate the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a very popular site in clinical TMS, it's used in many, many disorders, including depression as our treatment target, 
you'll see that in depression, actually, um, the activity is a network response, including the DLPFC, but also other areas. You see here uh, various networks, cognitive control network, an effective network, default mode network. All of these areas play a role. All of these networks play a role in depression. And there's one connection uh, that has been shown in various papers to be apparently especially important in the treatment of depression with TMS. And this is the connection of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex with the anterior cingulate cortex. There are data in depressed patients showing that if you stimulate the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you also modulate the anterior cingulate cortex because they are connected. Now, it has even been shown that the TMS can change the connection between the DLPFC and the anterior cingulate cortex. And it has been shown that this, this change in the connection between the DLPFC and the anterior cingulate cortex is correlated to improvements of depression. And this all indicates that what we actually want is not to change the activity level of DLPFC. That's not doing the trick. What we want is the spread of the activity from the DLPFC to the anterior cingulate in a robust and optimized way so that their connectivity can be modulated by the treatment. And how can we do this using the technology I showed you before? Well, we could just do the same thing. That's what we currently do. We measure at the DLPFC the spontaneous changes in the brain rhythm, and we test different frequencies. Could be alpha, could be theta. Um, it's, it's an open question, which frequency is most relevant here for the communication between DLPFC and anterior cingulate. We'll test that. And then we apply the TMS pulse synchronized to these ongoing changes in the strength of the rhythm, just like I showed you before on the healthy volunteers. We do this now and uh, we apply the pulse at different levels of strength, which is called power, but also at different moments in this sinusoidal curve. The rhythm, as I showed you, can be plotted as these waves. So uh, it's increasing and then decreasing, increasing and decreasing. And you can give a TMS pulse at different moments along the cycle. That's what we call the phase, the phase of the oscillation. So we're also gonna test whether giving the pulse at a particular phase at the peak or at the trough or somewhere in between at this ongoing rhythmic oscillation, whether this plays a role in the likelihood of this TMS pulse from getting propagated from the DLPFC to the anterior cingulate cortex because this is what we want in depressed patients. This is, this is what data has shown that it is this spread from the DLPFC to the anterior cingulate that is doing the trick that we want to modulate. So let's find the TMS pulse synced with the ongoing brain rhythm that gives us the most optimal, robust and reliable spread of our DLPFC TMS pulse to the anterior cingulate cortex. And this is something we do at the moment. And then the question is, well, assume we, we find that. Assume we know, well, yes, you can optimize the depression protocol because if you synchronize it with the ongoing brain rhythm, be it the strength or the phase, if you do that, then every single pulse is most optimal in doing the depression network modulation which is what you want. This will be the direct scientific basis of informing closed loop TMS. And what does closed loop TMS mean? Most uh, colleagues, and I'm sure even commercial uh, companies are, are trying to utilize this by measuring EEG and triggering the TMS by the EEG. And that's, a perfectly fine approach to do that. It would mean that you have your patient needing to undergo some EEG. We talked about this, maybe you can reduce the electrodes, but still you need EEG electrodes and you need to have good signal from the EEG. EEG is a very sensitive uh, method. And then they measure the spontaneous changes in this brain rhythm and trigger the TMS at the perfect moments of this brain rhythm. 
which is called then the closed loop. It's not so simple because every TMS pulse also resets the sprain rhythm. Uh, so it's, it's uh, I don't wanna go into the technical details, but there is a huge scientific debate whether you can actually call this closed loop or whether it's more open loop and, and so forth. But I don't wanna go into this. I wanna, I wanna suggest here an alternative which we are working on and which is forget about the EEG and all the troubles you know, of measuring it and then having the reset also with the TMS. So why not use another neuromodulation technique that's non-invasive, which is called transcranial electric brain stimulation. And it's a super simple, cheap, user-friendly portable device. It's one example is shown down here. It is a pretty much, it's a battery with two electrodes and you place these electrodes on the head of your patient. And there's a very low intensity current, few milliampere running between these electrodes. And there's a lot of research on transcranial electric brain stimulation that shows that this, even though it cannot induce uh, action potential, it doesn't make your neurons fire, it can change the resting membrane potential, which means makes these neurons more reactive in firing or not firing to internal or external stimulation. And it has been shown to be able to decrease and increase the excitability level, and it has even been used for treating depression. In a, similar way as TMS because it can decrease or increase excitability level of, for example, the DLPFC with encouraging results in bettering depressive symptoms. The great thing about this technology is that it's super safe. There are really literally no side effects. It's, it's simple and portable and easy. And you can do something with it, which we called transcranial alternating current stimulation which means that you use the same machine, but now instead of running one low intensity current between the electrodes, which we call TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, we do an alternating current stimulation, which means we really alternate the polarity uh, between these electrodes, which means that we can actually stimulate in a rhythm. And this rhythm has been shown, this TACS has been shown to actually be able to entrain, as we call it. So we force a certain rhythm on the brain. So instead of measuring the rhythm of the brain, we bring the brain rhythm under our control with this very simple portable device with TACS. So we put the TACS on our patient. We determine the brain rhythm. Since we determine it, we know it. And then just we give just a TMS pulse at the right TACS controlled moment of the right strength of phase of the controlled brain rhythm. So it's a TACS TMS combination based on the fundamental knowledge that we still have to deliver on which frequency band uh, is relevant for the depression network, which power level or phase is relevant. But once we know this, I assume this to be a general feature of the brain and not individually different. And then I think this could be utilized in a very user-friendly, feasible, practical way in a, um, into the standard TMS treatment. No need for, for EG and, and, and electrode paste and whatnot. And this is something that we work on at the moment and we have received funding to work on this and see whether this works, is feasible in patients and and if feasible, does it also mean better um, clinical efficacy compared to ignoring the sprain with them? These are all sloping questions, but questions we work on at the moment. How's the comfort level, Alex? How's the comfort level with TACS and TMS simultaneously? Yeah, you, uh, the TACS, you, you don't feel. Um, so it's, 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 it's similar to the TMS alone. Great, thanks. So you see here a sketch of the idea that we have um, um, for, for personalizing the TMS on based on this idea, um, finding, in the end, you could think about what people also do, knowing that this DLPFC anterior single connection is irrelevant, why not do the reverse engineering has been done you know, by colleagues now and, and published even in depressed patients that you just use fMRI to, to find the anterior single cortex that you wanna modulate and then work your way back to the cortex and find the exact spot within the DLPFC that is best connected in this subject with the anterior cingulate. That's the anatomical connectivity. 
there could be one, one, one way. And then based on this perfect spot, the perfect location, you use what I just told about um, the uh, individualizing the, the rhythm and synchronizing the TMS to the TACS controlled rhythm to have the best TMS protocol that interacts with the, with the rhythm and the network communication to always get your TMS in the most optimal way into the de depression network. And this can be done, this will be done, whether this means higher clinical efficacy, we will have to see. This will be the, hopefully in a few years from now, we'll know that. Uh, and the second problem uh, that I would like to address is the, the relapse. Um, this is just um, a simple visualization of what I, what I said before. So, and it's probably true for any sort of treatment, be it TMS or, or psychotherapy or even medication. If it's success, a successful treatment and somebody is in full remission, that's great. But if you discontinue this initially effective treatment, there's a very high chance of, of, of a relapse or re reoccurrence of depression. It comes in episodes and it's very likely that a depressed person will at one point has to go through another depressive episode if, if you don't do anything. And that's the big question of continuation or maintenance therapy. And there are, there are approaches out there also with TMS. When I give my courses, that's one of the main questions I get. Okay, um, what do I do after the six weeks? And I, 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 show, I, I always, every, every course I go again through the literature and there are studies out there claiming you should have booster TMS sessions or you should invite them to regular maintenance independent of their mental state or so. And then they kind of have follow-ups to see whether this maintenance or booster TMS is actually uh, preventing relapse or delaying it. But the data is not so super convincing and it's super inconvenient also, if you think about it. Um, that's another question I get from my TMS course participants is that if I tell them, well, this protocol works, this is great, you should do that, um, daily TMS for six weeks. Some say, well, is there not another way? Because for my patient, it's very difficult to travel to the clinic every single day for six weeks. How to combine this with life work? Or sometimes they just live far away from the next available TMS clinic. Uh, so that's already a problem for the acute treatment. And for maintenance continuation, it's even, even a bigger problem because it's kind of lifelong coming back uh, for maintenance. Uh, the compliance will probably reduce dramatically uh, because you don't, you're not depressed yet. So you, you, you're, you're less motivated and, and so forth. So this is really an unsolved problem. And one thing that we work on at the moment is um, why not use what I just talked to you, told you about, it's for electric brain stimulation um, technique. Uh, because of being so safe and portable and, and user-friendly, you could actually use it in an at-home environment. That's, that's, that's where, where we and many colleagues also work, work on. Uh, and there are, there are various companies that work on such a, uh, such a solution. Um, uh, uh, and um, and uh, what you need actually only is to, to develop a, a product that takes, let's say, this, this lab, equipment of the TES, which is already rather simple, as I said, a battery, two electrodes, to make it even simpler and variable and user-friendly and safe. And there are companies working on this and we're working together at the moment with a study um, uh, with a company called Plato Science. You see a picture of their headset to do at-home use TES. And there are data, clinical trials that test whether TES actually could work for the acute treatment of TMS as an alternative to TMS, if, if you like. The evidence is, uh, is not as convincing as it is with TMS at the moment. It's also the mere number of trials being done and the heterogeneity or so that, that, that makes it difficult to get, um, to get clear recommendations, even though it has, uh, according to, to one European article, a level B recommendation for being probably effective in treating depression. And according to a recent uh, article by, by American colleagues, uh, uh, Freni, from 2020, even level A evidence uh, being effective. I don't know, we will have to see, but even more so, I think it's a great tool to be combined with TMS as a maintenance and continuation treatment. So even if you wanna do the acute treatment rather using TMS, because it's established, it's FDA approved, it's covered by health insurances, 
do that. But after the six weeks, if people are at home, why not trying to see whether if they do this very easy to use comfortable TES at home, whether this actually helps to at least delay, maybe even prevent relapse and the need to have booster TMS sessions or so. And this is uh, something that has nobody has looked into this. I'm sure people are doing this at the moment, and we are one of them uh, partnering up with this with this particular company. But there are many others, I think, offering similar solutions, I hope. And I would encourage other colleagues to join us and do similar research, because it's a bit of a longer shot, because in order to show that something is a relapse prevention, you obviously need to wait for a long time before you have meaningful data that shows, well, you know, after a one year or two year follow up, indeed, the survival rate or the relapse rate in the TES home use group was significantly different from a no maintenance group or other forms of maintenance. So this is something I'm very excited about. And, and we also just started uh, a few months ago. Really, I think it's, that's, um, that's it for now. Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. And uh, so one of my, you know, my next questions was, how do you see the future of neuromodulation? And really, you've spoken about it a lot there. And is that really the, um, the home use and the prevention of relapse is uh, is a key feature. And uh, to have access now to the technology that we do now, technology is really developing so fast that it's possible to have these in our own home, which is fantastic. So we need to obviously do a lot of research uh, before before sending these devices out to people in their own homes and, and with in the Netherlands, in Australia, in, in different countries around the world, the reimbursement of TMS allows us to, uh, I guess, access a larger population um, yeah. and, uh, and and gives us the opportunity to, to have those longitudinal type studies or those longer term studies. So that's brilliant. Um, look, Alex, we, I've had a fantastic time listening to you talk about all your, your amazing work. Um, so I'd just like to thank you very, very much for joining me um, on this. And um, is there anything else you'd like to share with, uh, with anybody, any clinicians who might be watching this and, and um, perhaps considering neuromodulation in their own clinics? Um, yes, maybe. So first of all, thank you very much, Trevor. I also enjoyed this interview very much. Um, uh, always happy to hear an Australian accent again, because I had a wonderful time in Australia uh, uh, last year when I was in the West Coast. Wonderful country, wonderful people, the best beaches I've seen in my life. And uh, with, uh, with neuromodulation, yeah, I think it's really a booming, booming field now. And it's a great field to get into because it, it is a great tool, TMS, for us to, to research the brain, to learn about the brain. And at the same time, it's a tool where we can actually help patients. I see that we can make a difference in the life of these patients and there's nothing more rewarding than that. And I think we're just at the beginning of it because we use still so, so one size fits all very rough, simplified models to do it. And, and still it's, it's, it's successful, successful even successful enough even to be, to be officially recognized and reimbursed by health insurance for the case of depression. But there's so much more we can do to fine tune this, to personalize it. And of course, to, to apply it um, also in other contexts. I mean, there are, there are, there are great results on the horizon for OCD, uh, pain and, and other conditions. Uh, so I think I would, I would um, clinicians, I would, I would really invite to look into it and to consider it, uh, but to make sure that if you go into this to, um, to receive appropriate training, either by the, um, the Neuro Academy uh, course or other courses available. We also offer a course, Harvard University offers a course. I think it's vital to have a proper training in TMS techniques, technique and to have also community building there because the field is changing so rapidly. Uh, you see it probably in your course. I see it in my course that after a year, the things that I can teach or the evidence that we have is not, it's really fundamentally different almost, you know, it's really moving, moving on in a fast pace. So it's, I think it's important to stay in touch and to have something like best practices and guidelines what we work on. And uh, uh, I'm in love with the TMS as a therapy because it, it has so many advantages over other uh, therapies because um, it's, it's really like a, a brain-based therapy with, with little to no side, of, uh, with very few to no side effects. And, um, and it's, it's so flexible. And it's directly interacting, let's say, with this mysterious relationship between brain and behavior, brain and disease. So it, it really taps into this, into this um, 
yeah, into, into, the, into the causal substrates rather than having a, a systemic drug or so that floods the brain with, a, with, a, with, with all sorts of side effects. Uh, and therefore, I think neuromodulation is, is the future. In all ways, TMS might not be the, the only and the final technical solution. There are others developed, and I, and I welcome this also very much. So even if you have a technical or engineering interest, I think this is the place to be to also develop new technologies, you know, uh, focused ultrasound or uh, light-based or implants or so. That is, it, it's really a booming area and it's exciting to be uh, among those people. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, Alex. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your time and for joining us. And um, I'm sure the viewers will, will enjoy this very much. Have a great thank day. You very much. Yeah, bye.